It's Filter Free Friday, y'all. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Many of you have heard me tell the story about when I was 15 years old, studying at my dining room table, and the drug enforcement agency had a no-knock warrant. And with my sister and her brand new baby sitting on the couch, they used the battering ram and knocked the door down in three swift hits. Agents came into our home from everywhere, tossed me on the floor and put guns to my head and then proceeded to look for drugs in our house. <clears throat> I'll never forget that day because I could tell from the moment they came in that they knew they were in the wrong property. But that did not stop them from emptying drawers and turning over mattresses and creating utter destruction. At the end of the entire exchange, the dogs found a bag of potpourri. And I overheard an officer say to my mother, I'm sorry, ma'am. The door frame, the cleanup, the door, and all of the other costs associated with getting our home back to a place of decency was ours to take. The story I've never told The story I've never told is that in 2008, my son was 10. I'm working um, in a very respectable job. And I get a call from my mother. My mother, who I've seen cry maybe half a dozen times. And she's hysterical. It's the middle of the night. I don't quite recall what time it is. But um, I rush over to her, her house. And once again, the door is knocked off of its hinges. I go up to her room and she is sitting in a sea of dis disarray. Once again, the mattress is overturned and she is on the floor and she is in tears. She has had a gun pointed at her head again by police officers. And again, they find no drugs. And again, they say, I'm, I'm sorry, ma'am. And um, this time, I was an adult, so I decided I'm going to do something about it. So I call Alvin Brooks over at Ad Hoc Group Against Crime, and I tell him about this crime against my mother. And I don't know if it's because of Mr. Brooks' history as a police officer or some other experience that he's had, but he comes up with this story that suggests that perhaps there's a, a grandson who's selling drugs or perhaps there's a a nephew who's selling drugs who has come by my mother's house and, and that's why the police have come there to look for drugs. So I get frustrated with that process and I reach out to Terry Riley who was a former council member and I, I take pictures of my mother's house trying to show him the respectability of her yard and, and show him her beautiful flowers and her amazing fence and her fancy car and then I contrast that with the obvious drug houses on the street taking pictures of broken windows and barren yards and I and I say Terry my mother's house is not a drug house my mother feeds people in the community my mother has seven children all of whom have love interest and she has 36 grandchildren that is why there's so much traffic at my mother's house she's feeding people this has got to stop my mother could have died that night 
because my mother and my grandmother and her mother were all card carrying NRA members. My mother had a rifle, she had a semi automatic weapon, and she could have that night when she heard the door come crashing down, shot a warning shot to protect herself, and she, like Breonna Taylor, would have ended up dead. The police are not allowed to kill at will. It should not be okay to come into someone's home unannounced in the middle of the night and execute them. I have seen people try to explain this away in a million ways, but listen to me carefully because you can explain something does not make it all right. It is not okay. And to give you a modern day example of how these things can go wrong, this week, well, let me back up. My son is uh, living here in Kansas City in an apartment because of COVID. A school is virtual out in LA and uh, his the street that he was living on had 40 COVID cases and we made the uh, family decision that he would come back to Kansas City and he um, made a very good point that when he lives with me, I put him to work. Now I do pay him, but he can't hardly get his work done because of the amount of requests I have. Fair enough. So he's in an apartment. In his California kind of way of being, he reached out to all of his neighbors, going to see them directly and um, shared his phone number. And he shared his phone number because he wanted them to know that, you know, if there was an issue that they could just text him. Well, there was one white woman, the one who lives right below him, who said that she is just not a people person and she doesn't need his phone number. She doesn't imagine that there's anything that's going to happen. And actually, he recorded this exchange um, and has it on on his phone. It was uh, quite interesting. Well, fast forward to this week, she comes and knocks on his door and tells him that he plays his music too loud. And he's confused because... Um, he doesn't recall playing his music too loud. So he asks her when she says, well, late at night. And he's like, yeah, I don't, I don't play my music late at night. And he's like, well, I try to get in front of this by giving you my phone number so that when you hear music playing too loud or any other issue you have, you can just text me. And so she refuses. And her course of action is I'm going to call the police. She goes downstairs to her apartment and she calls the police on my 21-year-old black son. They're there in minutes. They're there so quickly that he thought it was her coming back, actually. The police officers are kind and nice, and he explains himself, and they tell him good luck with his, um, with his apartment neighbor. He calls me, and I go by, and we sit, and we talk about it, and he's trying to make logical sense of her action. Listen, bigotry and hatred and discrimination is, is not logical. But I want to be incredibly clear here. I only have one son. Had that turned out differently and my one son had ended up being killed for whatever reason, I don't need $12 million. And let me be even more clear. I don't want $12 million. And this week, people have said things to me like, I, I just hear it better when we live with, when we lead with love. Oh, well, I just don't understand what the, what the violence gets us. You know, I'm a, I'm a Peter kind of Christian. You know, if you aren't familiar with the story, Peter was a, a fisherman and fishermen were, physical and, and brute and not all smoothed around the edges. And if you kill my son, I have lived my life to the fullest. If I die today, I believe that there would be people who would say, Nicole has 
done some amazing things for my life. I believe that my name and its meaning, Victory for the People, has been fully fulfilled. And I will take everything out with me. You all don't understand. I, too, sing America. I am the darker brother. Life for me ain't been no crystal stairs had tax in it. And still I rise, I know why the caged bird sings. All these things black people do to be able to rise above the fray. I've got one son, that ain't me. You kill my one son and I will pull forth all the energy I have within me to tear everything up on my way out. And I couldn't care less who thinks love wins. And what is astonishing to me is that people ha don't have the ability to say. If somebody came to me today and said, Nicole, here's $12 million, kill yourself so that your family can be better off. Not many of you would take it. And those people who think that a $12 million settlement makes things better, I will tell you that if there's one thing black people know how to do, it's how to be poor and how to be joyous in that poverty. There's violence against people here in America and white people should be more concerned than anyone that they get killed at rates higher than anyone else on the globe by police officers. There have been 198 judges seated in the last four years by President Donald John Trump. Do you know how many of those seated were black people? Zero. We have an election upon us, and I know many of you don't believe that your vote matters. And I maintain that when we put people in the highest levels of leadership and they spew hatred, that hatred fills the hearts and minds of everyone under their tutelage. We have a lot of work to do but if there's anyone who knows how to do it, it's those of us who've been left out and left behind. The rejected stones are the ones called to the movement. Do not let people have you or cause you to think that groups of people who have never in the history of time stood up and led movements to create a more equitable world are going to do so now. They will not. Yes, we are a minority part of the population and yes, we have been minoritized. But the soul of this nation for which we are citizens has been saved plenty times before because of black people, because of brown people, because of women, because of indigenous people. That community-minded spirit is what is going to help us to rise again. How do you win when they cheat? We have example after example after example throughout our history and I regularly like to elevate Jesse Owens because in the high jump when they kept saying that he was standing on the line. He was so good at what he did that he took off from a spot well before, well before what could seem to be humanly possible. And sometimes I think people are so mad because no matter what they've tried, they have not been able to kill us. 
We are an astonishing people. And when you look at the history of everything that has occurred and what is occurring in modern day time, it is astonishing that I am here. It is remarkable that you are here. It is a testament that miracles do still exist. And in the words of the great Frederick Douglass, one man and God, a majority make. It's Filter Free Friday, y'all. We've got work to do. <laughs>